feels strange, the cable, I mean. Hi there. We live in now, and our now is a fused alloy of real and digital. With every question, with the answer of every question a click away, and with the oversaturation of information, there is less and less time for one thing, our patience. We want to know everything, and we want to know it now. Let's imagine this is not a live presentation, but a digital one, viewed on the screen of your computer or mobile device. What is the first thing that we all do when uncertain if a YouTube video has any interesting content? We fast forward, skim through it to see if it's worth our time. So I'd like to give you the same option now. I fast forward through this presentation. If you see nothing of interest, feel free to doze off. I know you can't leave because they locked it and <laughs> released the laser-eyed alligators, as far as I've heard. But you can take a nap. Now that we got that out of the way, whatever that is, let's move to more pressing matters, like me. I'd like to tell you a little bit about me because this would justify my point to where I'm going. You kind of understand my whole path to this. I like to think of myself as a creator and destroyer, although I'm often labeled in society for things like writing, uh, guerrilla marketing, managing creative projects, installations. Um, I'm currently head of creative for a UK-based clothing company, but a job is just a temporary form of expression, so that's not what I'm here for. My friends, uh, they say I look like a dog, and I like dogs, so let's follow my story accordingly. <laughs> right? Childhood. Cute kid, right? 4.0 version. We all wonder what happened. <laughs> all right. So I come from a family of uh, nice and well-cultured folks with a taste for the arts, which uh, has been, as much as the axe is given, quite in my way, because they've actively undermined the creative fields for me with things like, an artist doesn't feed a house, you'll live and die in misery, the world's full of pretentious and incapable writers and painters and musicians, you'll never be an original, don't even bother. So, pretty valid arguments, uh, but I've always had a problem with authority, so I only saw it as a challenge. And when I was five, I enrolled into piano lessons in my local community store. I was <laughs> obsessed by the instrument that at that point I learned all the inbuilt melodies of my toy synthesizer by ear and thought this was the beginning. It all started with the first 15 seconds of Führ Elise and ended with the first 15 seconds of Führ Elise. Never got a piano, world's full of starving pianists, right? So, then came the drawing. I became obsessed with uh, fantasy books and action figures and comic books and, you know, role-playing games. I devised my own games and worlds. And I kind of saw the next step as writing, you know, making my own books. So when I was 15, I wrote a novel called Outrunning Fate, a fantasy book, which I went to my local publisher and said, look, at an annual book fair, said, look, you're going to publish my book. You're the only one I'm going to talk to. He published all my favorite books. And he said, yeah, yeah, sure, but took 15 pages, gave them to his son, didn't even read. And it's kind of how it happened. A couple of months later, the book came out and was translated into Russian. At that point, that was kind of a big deal because they hadn't published any Bulgarian authors. And when I went to my local bookstore, I saw my name between Tolkien and Terry Pratchett, and I thought to myself, this was it, the delusions of grandeur, you know. Uh, I was a little confused. And uh, then came photography as a mean to get girls naked in front of the camera, all in the name of art, right? <laughs> so... The fear my parents had instilled of living and dying miserably and originally, though, remained. So instead of an art school, I enrolled into the American University with business administration and journalism. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
I thought I could do it all. I wanted to do everything, everything. I never believed in the one job per person philosophy. And fine, I'd be a business artist. It's all possible. What was that all about? But I was struggling, you know, with heavy courses that had nothing to do with my previous interests. And I felt dry and boring and stupid. Even now, I mean, I must confess, I can't, really, I can't divide on paper and multiply. You know, I've heard of this mythical technique called carry the one, but never mastered it. So I was struggling with this and having pressure from my folks and from the university and from society, what should be considered success. And my publisher was waiting on me with this book. And in the same time, I was watching Fight Club and reading it and considering my, you know, uh, all-star previous self-improvement. Like Chuck Palahniuk says, nothing but masturbation. Um, I hid from my publisher and destroyed the 700-page manuscript for my sequel to my book. I was under the notion that I'm doing so many things, that I'm good at many things and great at nothing. And uh, I looked for reasons not to create, basically for distractions. And this uh, became quite troublesome. I had to either get a real job or decide if I'm going to still fool around. And at that point, I met, you know, seeking destruction, distraction. I met this guy, Michael Cohen. You know, professor in the, uh, at the university, writer, uh, creative writing. You know, him and his family, his wife sort of justified all my lunacy of creative destruction before that. And they formulated the word that this might be art, that I might be an artist rather, rather than a lunatic. So I uh, got really re-inspired and abused the guy quite some in my work, but got really re-inspired in uh, the 60s, the beats, you know, Burning Man with its minute energy capturing, you know, the moment and then releasing it back to the university, to the universe, not the university, you know, Freudian slip, uh, through the fire. And most of my fellow students would go to work and travel programs, but I decided that uh, we should hitchhike with my friend from Belgium to Amsterdam and stay there four days. Ended up spending for five months. You know, where we lived in uh, Hells Angels uh, Tattoo Studio, and um, we, you know, whoop, whoop, whoop. We were around, you know, we took part in squatting revolutions and some ur urban movements. We were around poets and musicians and artists, and it was really re-inspiring. So at that point, I had been under the notion that I'm actually writing a book, you know, the chronicle of my travels through the prism of my characters. As it turned out, a project is shaped by you as much as it shapes you, you know, you're just there to feed it, you know, it becomes something completely else in the end. So I was feeding not a novel at that point, but rather something else. I had all these high resolution images and a story to wrap it around, you know, and a concept. So organically, it uh, turned into something else, a fusion of all my interest and skills up to that point, something called the Living Museum. What is it? In a nutshell, Living Museum is live display of time and space. And furthermore, a dynamic platform for installations that gathers a moment. It could be an epoch, an epoch, an ideology, a city, and puts it in a museum where all exhibits come to life. The mission of Living Museum is to gather artists on a global and local level and to put them under one theme together, working, you know, and why and how? At this point, I was really wondering, how am I supposed to raise all this, you know, the money issue? And suddenly all the presentations and papers I had done at AUBG, the education I had previously hated, became quite useful, you know? They kind of gave life to my work and transcended from just the theoretical concept. So Living Museum does advertising in a radical and innovative way. It takes a brand and intertwines it in its uh, installations to present it to the viewer as modern art. Whether through fire shows, 3D mapping, you know, augmented realities and visual experiences, uh, the point is to make out of the brand a pop brand or a living brand. It does not influence the content of the work itself. It only 
empowers, you know, the, the, the feeling of it without actually being influenced. You know, it's, we, we try to choose sponsors that fit within our current topic. Where living, a living museum can never be repeated in the same way because uh, it happens, then it disappears again, and it's done in huge undeveloped construction buildings or spaces outdoor, and the point is to really capture the moment and to transform the role space in that moment before change, you know, the only constant. And another thing of Living Museum is that after it, we destroy all the installations and work, except for the work we sell. For one or the other reasons, we do not destroy our live performers after the show, so far. My point is don't be afraid to mix styles, you know, to use business or just forget about labeling. Our first show, Amsterdam, um, was influenced again by my travel in Amsterdam. It was Amsterdam through the prism of Wonderland and vice versa. A surreal experience where the user, that's the visitor of Living Museum, becomes an active participant, you know? That's the installation where we had with the two twins, Queen of Spades and Queen of Hearts, between a red light district window. No Wonderland without its white rabbit, too, like we had. And for this, we squatted a monumental tobacco warehouse where we held 4,000 people over three days. And suddenly I realized that other people felt like me, that they wanted to experience it life, you know, and be part of that and that there were other dogs of my breed, you know? <laughs> dogs from my canine, from my generation. And the Living Museum, really, when you work in it, it becomes a living organism. Everybody is changing something, finishing um, different installations. Even bartenders and security guards become participants because it changes through the days. It's always constantly, constantly changing until it's gone. Uh, you know, giving back the energy. And our next topic was living socialism. At this point, we thought our previous show was such a success, you know, the sky's the limit. We were so wrong. Then came the winter, our first December show. And it was basically not a political, I mean, the totalitarian uh, regime viewed through a new eye, the eye of the young generation that has been raised in the graveyard of its buried ideology for our region, you know, the Balkans, surrounded by totems and symbols and stuff we do not quite comprehend but are used to living with. And some live exhibits, that's actually my grandma there, you know, socialism exhibits. And we wanted to show that we know nothing of socialism, yet we're part of it, you know. In a way, we carry it in our genes. We are the bastard children of socialism. Forbidden commodities. The point is that we thought this was really going to be because we put a lot of soul into it, but then a week before the show, our sponsors abandoned us with notions like, we don't want to be you know, connected with uh, delicate topics like socialism. We want European themes, you know, we'll be behind you on that. We thought, like, this was the death of Living Museum and true socialism in a way, you know, true communism uh, in our microcosmos. So, at this point, you know, we had dictators on stilts and many, many other interactive installations. 
nevertheless, we managed to pull the rabbit out of the hat, and um, the show was widely accepted by the audience, and it was covered by international media, uh, Washington Post, listed it in its top 10 uh, cultural events for 2010, and yeah, I mean, the idea worked somehow. So I've been leading up to this point that all of this felt like the next step, really, the next level of our expression would be tied to one thing, you know, the internet. I've always felt there was something wrong, you know, with uh, the world, like with, especially with young people, us being, I always imagined a bunch of corporate gray heads sitting at a think tank, figuring out our own tastes and what we're gonna like, dream for, desire, strive, what exactly is success and how we are given information, you know, how it's delivered to us. With the internet, this disappears in a way and we have, I mean, it's been a revolution since because we have a way for the DOI approach, you know, the gonzo, first hand, do it yourself, reach out there, find out what you want exactly. So the next step really, really felt like this, Living Web. This is our new show, you're all welcome to come. It's gonna happen in Sofia first, and then if all goes well, in London. Introducing the term real virtuality, not virtual reality. Real virtuality is basically the notion of our lives transcend from the physical into the digital, more and more. You know, life becomes existent in the intervals of on and offline. So what we try to do with this, is take the concept back from the digital into the physical. Create physical internet, real virtuality. And our exhibit is an installation that captures three words, entertainment, education, and advertising. Uh, we're gonna have this real physical representation of websites connected and intertwined with hyperlinks full of living programs and them like. Google, Firefox, you know, even security guards will be Norton's. One of the installations we have is the web TV, YouTube Reminiscent, where a user that's an active participant in the viral of Living Web, I mean, everyone who comes, it's not just a, a, a viewer, he, he will take part of it. A user comes and writes a song or a video, and three actors improvise on it live. If they don't know, the song or the material, or if the request is inappropriate, they would present a 404 sign error. <laughs> um, Facebook, Twitter, you know, everything. And the whole point is to be accessible from many different points. The exhibit, we will have a person with a mounted camera on their head who's gonna go through the gallery and the park that the event happens. And around town, there will be scattered screens in the shape of an eye with the Google map, you know, mark. Uh, and since this is Skype, people will not only be able to see what happens in the exhibit, they'll be able to tell a moderator, move left, move right, do this, explore that area, you know, and in a way, the whole installation becomes accessible from every point of the city. A competition that we're doing, again, the do-it-yourself approach, is how to, how to do your own online experience live, you know, even, if, even as a tourist, for example. We will be accepting videos. This is one of our first. A little bit of volume up, maybe. Luckily, I didn't get arrested. Yep, so you're all welcome to come. We'll have, in addition to that, a live internet technologies and innovations expo. We will have, um, you know, 
social topics, addressing the internet experience as in the word web as a spider web, something that entangles us and that through it we are never the same. You know, you, we could come to we could come to become something uh, beautiful or sinister. It's all based on us. You know, it's good to address these topics and. Since then, I've been trying to balance the equation, commercial and indie, going back to my original point, basically struggling with what I have to do, what to survive. I tried to take interesting projects like, uh, you know, movies, clothing, uh, presidential campaign, viral made of toys. Um, and yeah, this is, I got back to writing, this is my book. It's called Cyan, it'll be soon on the market, hopefully, magical surrealism. Where am I going with all this? The conclusion? No conclusion. <laughs> the music goes on, you know, one continuous dance. The key to creating, I think, is creating. Just go out there, do it, change, evolve. You know, you have an obligation towards your talent. And what is talent? In my opinion, uh, the sum of genuine interest plus hard work. You know, and regarding the destroying, I mean, just what I want to say is don't be afraid to destroy the notion of your own identity or who you are or labeled by society if this is going to bring something new, you know, if it's going to bring, give birth to something new. You know, if we're, we are to view birth as the ultimate creation, we have to consider death, its mirror. I think they're closely tied together like two poles on the magnet. And just really you have to service that obligation Find time, kill doubt, build immunity for distractions, use all the tools inside and outside the box, listen to your critics, then reject them. <laughs> Everything is a tool for expression. Never limit yourself in creating and in identity. Be creators and destroyers. Hang on, but let go. Thank you very much. <laughs>